God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord today. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. I'm going to ask our media team to prepare our hearts with putting. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7 on the screen for you just to be looking at while I share something with you. I was talking yesterday to someone and he mentioned that he had gone to his urologist and, and had some levels that were elevated and different things. And so they told him to come back a second time and he did. And they told him to come back a third time and they did. And so the next moment I was with a urologist and an oncologist. My wife and I would, would kind of think, man, there's nothing to all this. Don't worry about it. She was somewhere else. And he went in there and, and they said, I said, sir, you have cancer. He said, I, I went out into my car and uh, sat there for just five minutes in the parking lot really not saying anything, but the mind kept replaying this, this question. God, what's your plan now? God, what's your plan now? You know, we, we hear in the scripture where it says that men will cry peace and safety, but sudden destruction will fall. You don't just get peace because you say it. <laughs> yeah. You ever tried it? I am going to be at peace over this. <laughs> but a great evangelist that used to come before he passed over in our little building many, many times, his name is Hollis Hopkins. He would say this phrase that I know that you heard from my dad and myself as we repeated it from him. It's different when it happens at your house. Okay. Isn't it amazing how that we, if let's just be transparent, we can more easily and with sometimes even with more fervor pray over someone here at the altar or a virtual stranger and have faith for them, but when it happens in our house. Okay, all right. I think Jesus is a good example of that. When he's on the cross, I don't know in his humanity, I know in his, in his divinity that he was the great forgiver and redeemer, but in his humanity, he was struggling. And we hear him say, Father, Forgive them. Not necessarily I forgive, but Father, you forgive. Why? Because it's different when it happens at your house. If you were on the cross and you were naked and your mama was watching you and people were laughing and <coughs> and we have to believe because the scripture tells us that Jesus was fully God and fully man. He was not some kind of half being. Okay, so he was subject to all of the trouble and the passions and the feelings. He was the one who said, Lord, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And so we get to this verse. And, everybody say that with me, and. That word, if, you, if we don't get to that word, then we're not going to fully understand the context of the scripture. And is a conjunction. And is a word that either links something or says something else must be added to. So it is and. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate that. I had a spiritual son and had a grandson. Just ready to take care of it. 
Amen. Oh, that was good. I can hear my dad say that. Okay. And is a link, which is saying that in order for this scripture to be profound and hit the mark, you have to link it and the peace of God. Something is happening and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And so here we are. And many of you in this room could testify to this. Sometimes we forgot the and part. We were ready for the peace of God that passes understanding, but we just didn't do the and. I, I have a fear, and the fear is, is that the church, I'm talking about the church, the church, if we in these last days don't bow up, we're going to bow down. If we don't have a backbone, if we do not preach and teach the word of God, if we don't lay claim to Christ as the king and the redeemer, if we don't say no to sin, for the sake of inclusion, let me tell you something. We have the most inclusive faith in the world. Jesus said, whosoever will, let him come. But there are stipulations and there are boundaries after you receive salvation. Let me put it to you this way. Salvation is God's job. Discipleship, which is following Christ, is our job. Look at your neighbor, smile at them, about three seconds. See, it's weird, isn't it? I mean, even husbands and wives and mothers and daughters are having weird old feelings right now. Okay. Look at them again and say, shalom, shalom. All right. <coughs> We're going to talk about making room for peace. Making room for God's peace. Now, we worship God in unlimited liberty. There is spiritual liberty right now. There's no mistake about it. We have the liberty to worship God. The Bible declares it, and the Holy Ghost provides in 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Now, the Lord is that Spirit, capital S, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus is quoting Isaiah 61, and in verse 1, to detail why he was sent, one of his main mission objectives, and it was to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Galatians 5 and 1, or John 8, 32 tells us, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Galatians 5 and 1 tells us, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Do you remember what Jesus said to the woman that the people wanted to pass judgment on her? He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and... All right, there was liberty in her life. But go and sin no more. Don't be entangled again. And let me tell you something. When you have had freedom in Christ, when you have had liberty in Christ, hold on to it. Let it be precious to your spirit right now. (laughs) 
Verse 14 of Galatians 5 says, we have been called to liberty. So no doubt through the word of God and through the Holy Spirit, we have the liberty to worship. But we also have human liberty. Here we are this morning without constraint, singing, praising, and worshiping the God of peace. It's a blessing and a joy to live in these United States of America. Now, regardless of its quirks and its hang-ups and the trouble that it's in, nobody stopped you from coming here. We sung what we want to. I'm preaching what I want to. You walked in here of your own accord. Nobody is closing or opening the door. This is a free country, and we ought to be thankful for it. Regardless of whether there are groups or government overreach that tries to oppose it, our First Amendment clearly states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Go to church when you want, how you want, baby. So inside or outside this building, we can do like King David. Now, let me just stop and tell you, I, I had a wild hair early this morning, but the Holy Spirit said, now look, don't go crazy. So I backed off of this. He bridled me back. I almost about this point said, hey, everybody get up, go outside. We're having the rest of church outside. We're going to be on the grass, and we're going to shout, and we're going to sing, and we're going to praise God. We're going to glorify Him. And let me tell you something. If, that would, if the Holy Spirit would have allowed it at that time, because God is not about making a spectacle. He's about giving a demonstration. Somebody ought to preach with me right there. Okay? All right. So in his time, he said, no, you stay right here. But if we did, it doesn't matter what anybody thought, how crazy we look. It wouldn't matter what anybody said. I'm telling you, it wouldn't matter if the council or the mayor or the president would have come through here. We have freedom. Yeah. I love it. But liberty does not bring peace. All believers are here free to worship. But maybe not all in this room or that are watching online are at peace. You may have driven from a home and a family that is not at peace. You may be watching and sitting amongst people of whom there is no peace. You may be here worshiping with distressed and disturbed thoughts. You may be singing from a broken heart. You may be saying amen, but your mind is shouting, I don't know. You see, a life without peace is like walking with dust in your eyes. You move, but vision is hampered. The destination is blurred and the pain is real. That's what it feels like to be without peace. Wait a minute. Listen to me. I found me again. Okay. Listen to me. The peace is not ever able to be manufactured. You don't just think it and it happens. Has everybody in this room, and I say everybody, does everybody in this room have a similar story where you were happy, 
things really were going right. There was no reason. But all of a sudden, anxiety and trouble or fear and trepidation hit your heart. And you found yourself not at peace on your inside when it looked like everything was going well. Why did you wake up this way? But while liberty does not bring peace, praise God, peace does not require liberty. Daniel was thrown in a lion's den. And he not only survived, but he slept like a baby. Now, I don't know what a baby really sleeps like. Some of the parents, I was thinking of Jonathan and Caitlin right now. If that means every two hours and getting up and pooping and eating, then I don't know. Okay? All right? But it sounds good. But the truth of the matter is Daniel slept at peace. Can you imagine leaning up against the mane of a lion? Folding your arms back behind your head. <laughs> yeah. How many of us would have been pacing? <laughs> Waiting for the growl. Okay. I know it's coming. I know I, I thank you God I made it an hour. Okay. Apostle Paul was in the darkness of a dungeon. But he enjoyed the light of God's peace. And about midnight, he and Brother Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And let me tell you something. They didn't have to wait for the doors to be jarred open to already have peace. From another prison, Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, 9, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. I'm chained right here, but the word of God is not bound. <laughs> oh, yeah, Paul loved peace. He preached peace. He lived in peace. He died in peace and dwells in peace today with the Prince of So if you can't muster it up and all you can do is make room, how do we attain it? Friends, the peace of God is meant to be experienced rather than explained. I'm preaching to you right now the best way I can. But what the Holy Ghost wants to do is when he's done with me talking to move me to the side and to fill you with the presence of God that will give you the peace. And so you can tell somebody, I may not know what it is, but I sure know when it ain't. Okay. And I feel the peace of God. I feel the anointing of God. And I don't know. Hey, my circumstances haven't changed. People haven't changed around me. But right now, I have peace that surpasses all understanding. <laughs> I just got it. You say, well, help me. I told you it has to be experienced. I can't give you a 10-point formula. Okay? I can't tell you how many scriptures to read or how many hours to kneel. It has nothing to do with it. Listen, you have to receive freely salvation. You have to receive filling the baptism of the Holy Ghost freely. And you have to receive peace freely. Freely you have received and then freely give it. Look at verse 7 again. They'll throw it on the screen, and the peace of God which passes all understanding. We can study how the peace of God gives us rest. A place where God rules and manages, free from chaos, free from whatever hassles and disturbs or worries us. We can preach messages for the rest of the year on God's peace. And I can exhaust myself trying to explain the comfort and strength. But the truth is, peace passes understanding. 
It goes beyond. Oh, 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 I'm about to feel it right now. Because when my understanding is limited, when I don't know why or how or where or when, the peace of God goes way beyond my understanding. And I don't know why I should be feeling so good when everything is so. So. There was an old man that would sit right here in the front of this church and he would say, I may feel so bad in my body, but I feel good in my soul. Peace. Truth is, you have to feel God's peace for yourself. It's like my grandchildren enjoying a piece of candy. They'll come in. Look, Papa. Look, Papa. Look. That looks good, baby. But listen to me. They don't waste time. They don't say, now, Grandfather. (laughs) The sugar-infused syrup that is in this piece of candy is making the taste buds of my tongue have a feeling of joy and rapture. What do they do? Try it! Want to taste? That's what they do. And I'm telling you, you can't explain it. Your neighbors and your friends and your loved ones don't know how you feel, what you're feeling. But look at them and go, hey, I can't explain it, but just try him. Just try him. And he will give you the peace that passes understanding. Oh, I feel the prayer. Just try him. Hey, I challenge you. I double dog dare you. Try A lot of times I do try their candy. (laughs) How can we experience the peace of God? The peace of God is better described as peace with God. Man who is guilty of sin cannot know God's peace until he or she has first felt what it's like to be forgiven. I can cry as many tears as the next person on the altar. But unless I have felt the love of Jesus who forgives me of all my sins, I walk away as guilty as I ever was. But baby, it didn't happen to me. And I promise you right now, if you will accept Jesus as your Lord, you don't have to worry. He ain't going to pass you by. You will have peace. The moment that you get up, you will no longer feel guilty. But you'll be free you'll have peace (laughs) you can dance like anybody else in here and say you're on the way to heaven if I owed a large debt let's say my mortgage I've been thinking a long time about it Lord, thank you for the job. Lord, help me keep my job. Lord, give me favor. Let me make the mortgage the next month. Let me make it the next year. Don't know how the economy's going to go, but Lord, you be with me. Let's say I'm having those types of prayers, and one of you and say, I'm paying off your mortgage. the end of the month you will no longer have a note I'm going to tell you what's going to happen immediately not later not trying to pull myself back but immediately I'm going to go from fretting 
over my mortgage to not thinking about it. The only thing that I will think about is I have a house and it's mine. And I'm going to keep praising God and think, and look, it won't matter. Brother Troy, maybe you're the one that paid my debt and you didn't tell Sister Ann and you used all y'all's money and she comes up to me and says, Brother Steve, I can't believe that he did that and now he's used our money and he's paid your debt. I'm going to say, I'm sorry, but God bless you. And I'm going to tell you, when you have been forgiven of your sins and you have been redeemed with the purchase price and you had a debt to pay that you could not owe and Jesus come in and take out all of your sin, it ain't going to matter who thinks you deserve it or not. You're going to say, praise God, I am free. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Ann, for letting me use you. <laughs> Next time I'll let you be the good one and he'll be the bad one. Okay. I used to feel guilty. And now I'm a glad overcomer. And I don't care what anybody thinks except God. And I do care what God thinks. Because he's given me a gift so precious, so wonderful, that I got to take care of it. I can't live the same old way, can't think the same way. But I, I got eternal life now. And no man can pluck me out of the hand of God. And I got to take care of that. I'm going to live in the morning free if I'll take care of it. Isaiah 9 and 6 prophetically describes Christ as the Prince of Peace. For unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given. And the government, everybody say government, shall be upon his shoulders. What does that mean? God says yes and no. We think people and governmental entities and world orders are saying yes and no. No, they're not. Okay. God raises up and puts down. Okay. The government will be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, the Prince of Peace is not this idea that there is some snotty-nosed teenage boy with a little crown on his head because his daddy happens to be the king. The Prince of Peace in the Hebrew means Shar Shalom. And that means the one who removes all peace-disturbing factors and secures his peace. Shar Shalom, what does it mean? That meant that anything that is in the way of your peace, God is able to extract all of that out of your way. That's the first part. Number two is that when he empties you of all of the disturbing factors. Uh-oh. Let me tell you something. What do you say? What are you talking about? You mean you're never going to have any trouble? No, it's going to be like this. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. <laughs> you can fight, you can gripe, but I'm eating. Because God's got me. Now, if he's preparing a table, he's going to give you the protection. He's going to defend you and give you the ability to eat of that table. <laughs> now... That's the peace because we understand that he secures that. And now John 14, starting at verse 26, I'm going to ask them to put it on the screen. Jesus is talking, and before we actually get into it, before we actually read it, I need to give you the historical context. 
In less than 50 years, in less than the time that my dad first became pastor of this church, here's what's going to happen. From the time that Jesus said this, in less than 50 years, Titus, the son of the Roman emperor Vespasian, is going to destroy Jerusalem and demolish the temple. In less than 50 years, matter of fact, it's about 40 years, all of the men who were following, and women who were following Christ, many of them are still alive. And they have now seen the Romans come in and destroy Jerusalem, ransack it, and tear down the temple. Think of it. The disciples knew Jesus was the Messiah. They had followed him with abandon. They had believed in him. And when he said, I go to prepare a place, that was great. Listen to me. But it did not give them rest. They heard Jesus say, My kingdom is not of this world. Yet, it was their world. They heard him say, I'm giving you peace, but not like the world gives it. They hear him say, I go to prepare a place for you, and I'll come back. I've prepared a mansion, and I'll receive you to myself. But I can actually hear Peter's thoughts. That's nice, but I don't need a mansion. I need a job. If you're leaving, and I believe you are going back up into heaven, I'm telling you, I was a fisherman, but I kind of got a feeling I'm going to be a preacher, and I got a family, and I don't know what's going on. Do you hear me? Matthew, he says, great, Lord. I'd love to have that mansion, but what I need are friends. I lived my life before following you off of your people. I didn't have any friends. I stole from them. And you're going to be gone. And I'm going to need some friends. And by the way, I too need a new revenue stream. Because I don't know how I'm going to make money because I've been making money being a shyster. Thomas he says Lord I believe we're going to be in heaven I believe that you're the son of God but I need reassurance I got these thoughts running over in my mind my heart says to believe you my soul says to believe you but I got doubts I don't need a mansion. I need confidence. And let's get real right now. You are here because of your faith. You may be watching because you trust and believe God. And we got family members from north of, of, uh, of the United States down that's part of our family. And I mean an active part of our family. Okay? They love you, they pray for you, they give into this ministry. But let me tell you something, whether you're not, you're in this room or outside this room. Just because you know there's a heaven to gain doesn't mean that you have rest right now. Let's just pull the veneer off this. Because this is a walk of faith, baby. And the just will live by faith. Some of us in this room and watching. I believe all that, but what about the here and now? What happens when peace doesn't look like or feel like peace? For some, maybe you're in this room. Life and the future looks impossible. Some of you may be going through a struggle that you could never have imagined. 
And you might be thinking, Pastor, I love the message, but what I need is a miracle. Give me relief. If I could get a miracle, then I could know peace. I don't need another theory. And please, Pastor, don't be offended. I don't need somebody preaching at me. I need peace. Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm not offended at all. Because my message alone ain't going to help you. But if the Holy Ghost will take it and multiply it in your life, and then if this preacher will allow the Holy Ghost to move in your life, you won't just be thinking about you needing peace. You'll start experiencing it. You'll start experiencing it. Jesus is saying to his followers, I'm going to give you my peace, and without it you cannot take what's coming. That's what these verses are going to say. Now read with me. Verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. What's the peace? Wrong question. Who's the peace? You see that in verse 27? Now, go back to verse 26. But the, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said unto you. Now, I'm going to tell you something. There's been a lot of people that's tried to bring up to my remembrance stuff. Anybody ever been there? They know your story, and they're glad to repeat it to you. Okay? All right? They tell you this and that and something else. But what the Lord loves to do is through the Holy Ghost. He likes to teach you and bring back to remembrance what Jesus said. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, if you come to me, I will in no wise cast you out. He reminds, peace now, verse 27, I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. What is it saying? Make room for peace. Now, here's a part that if you will start doing, God will finish. Listen to me. If you will start pressing yourself not to be troubled, God will finish it and get you out of the trouble. If you will allow yourself to pull out fear and anxiety as best you can, what will you say? God is my redeemer. Baby, I don't know how we're going to make it, but God's going to take care of us. So you begin to force that fear out. And when you force your fear out, then God fills it up with courage and boldness and strength. Oh, the circumstances may not have changed, but the whole atmosphere has. Instead of shying away, you're ready to press in. <laughs> yeah. Come on, we got this. If the wind's coming, I'm just going to lean into it. <laughs> you have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again to you. If you love me, verse 28, you would rejoice because I said I go unto the Father. If you loved me, you would rejoice. We'll come back to that word rejoice here in a minute. Because I said I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Now watch this. And now I have told you before it come to pass that when it does come to pass, you can believe. Now the disciples, they weren't getting it. He had just said they're going to destroy the temple in three days, but in three day, or destroy the temple, but in three days I'm going to build it back up. He didn't know what he meant. They didn't know about it. He said, I'm going to give you my peace. I'm going to leave it with you. And they went, what do you mean you're going to leave my peace with you? He's going to leave the comforter. 
He's going to relieve the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's going to be that peace. And now the ones who were hiding themselves away before are finding themselves going out into the world in the power of the Holy Ghost. And now Peter's not worried about a job. He's worried about being a servant of the Most High. And when it's time for him to die, he said, ah, no, no, no. Hey, you're going to crucify me well and good. Crucify me upside down. That's peace. Shalom. Shalom. The most common greeting and the parting phrase of Israel is shalom. And more emphatically, it's shalom, shalom. It is a greeting that finds its meaning in the word of God. That's a big revelation to you, isn't it? Israel using the word of God. Isaiah 26 and 3, here's where they get shalom, shalom. Follow with me. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. It is a verse that is in the middle of a song. If you'll look at verse 1 of that same chapter, it'll say, hey, here is a song that's going to be sung in the day of the salvation of the Lord among the nation. It's according to verse uh, chapter 25 if you read it. That's the song. Now it starts there and that's, that's one of the verses. It's the day of the Lord's salvation. Another verse in that song is verse 7. The way of the just is uprightness. He makes our path smooth. Or, or he does weigh the path of the just. What does that mean? The Lord is making our path smooth and he's making the crooked path straight. I'm going to tell you what peace is. Peace is knowing that your next step is the right step. Doesn't mean it'll be the easy step, but it's the right step. And so in Isaiah 26 and 3, he will keep in perfect peace. Now watch, verse 3, Jehovah will keep. What does that mean? Guard, keep watch over. He will not keep in, but with would be the best way to put it. Keep you with perfect peace. Because sometimes you're going to get in stuff, and sometimes you're going to get out of stuff, and sometimes you're going to get in stuff, and sometimes you're going to get out of stuff. And if your peace is relegated to that, no, you have peace with God. Peace with God. Peace with God. Though God slay me. Know that he's well able to deliver me out of the fire. But if he don't, I'm not bowing. Peace with God. Lay not this sin to their charge. Peace with God. And then Jesus said in verse 30, Hereafter I will not talk much with you, For the prince of this world, the devil, he's coming, and he has nothing in me. But don't fret. I told you, my peace I leave with you. And greater is he that lives within us than he. He said he's going to pour out his wrath. In Revelation chapter verse 12, we get that prophetically in it. it says in Revelation 12, as soon as I can find it, in verse 12. That the devil... In the last days is going to be loosed. Said he will bring his wrath. The devil will bring his wrath. Why? Because he knows it's just for a season. I think we miss over that. 
that scripture. Tammy, if it says that the devil is going to be loosed prophetically, how, what can we infer from that? That today he's bound. You say, wait a minute, the devil's working everywhere. Don't you tell me, the devil's been working with, trying to work on me. devil has limitation he cannot do anything that God is not allowing as a matter of fact we are under the same umbrella that Job was do what you will but don't touch his life their life is mine their soul is mine you can do what you want so the devil is bound he's constrained there is a time coming that the Lord is going to loose him and the wrath of the devil is going to come over this world but let me tell you something we should not be worried about the devil's wrath we should be worried about the wrath of God I don't want to be here when there's no more remedy. I don't want to be here when there's no more righteous drawing. <coughs> the presence of God has limited the devil. Do you know what causes the devil to appear bigger, more intense, more evil? more vicious more sadistic is our own mind our own heart so what if he afflicts me I have a healer so what if he tries to bind me I have a deliverer so what if he tries to tempt me to sin have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. So what can he do? Fear not the one who can destroy the body, but fear rather the one that can destroy both soul and body of hell. That is reserved for God. And I want you to stand. So we come to this close. Peace is not the absence of trouble. It's the presence of God with you in trouble. And whatever comes our way, God is already there. You don't have to say, hey God, get over here. I'm in a mess. Hey, hurry. He's already there. Before you got there, he was there. And so he said, I'll give you perfect peace. Now, the word perfect is not in the original Hebrew. We have to use that word. It's actually shalom repeated twice. So here's what it would say in the Hebrew. You will keep in shalom, shalom, whose mind is stayed on thee. You see, Hebrew grammar does not have superlatives like good or better or best. To show degrees, it repeats. Let me give you an example. There were some seraphim. And they cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. That's what they say. Holy, not, here's our holiest God. No, that's that's our language. That's English. They go, holy, holy, holy. (laughs) Now, I want to think about the worship of the seraphim because I believe that this is where you can really attack the devil okay 
listen to me. The seraphim were there. And if you read in the scripture in Isaiah, it said in Isaiah chapter 6, said with they had six wings, three pairs. With one set, they covered their eyes or face. The next, they covered their feet. And the next, they flew. I believe we can take this and we can see the example of how our worship should be. So when I researched it, I asked the question, why did they cover their faces? It was an act of humility because the light of God's presence was too magnificent for one to bear. And it was also because the reason that they, they existed at all was reserved for God. So they didn't look at man and what man wanted to do or what man thought. They actually covered their faces and they were saying, God, we are only going to move at your word. You're magnificent. What about the feet? Why did they cover their feet? It's an act of modesty. Now let me just tell you, we need to bring back modesty. Can I preach on the clothesline? Can you give me a minute? Just hold your breath. It's like I tell our grandkids when we go through that tunnel. Can you hold your breath through the tunnel? If you don't like this, just hold your breath. Okay. You talk about the clothesline. It's not the what. It's the how. It's how you wear what you wear. When we walk in this place, when we are out there in the world, And we have woken up with this commission by God to be a light to the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. Then it's not whether I'm wearing pants or not or short breeches or long breeches. It's the disposition and the demeanor by which I approach God. And so if we come in here and we want attention... And we don't want to give glory to God. I do not care what it is. It's wrong. If you're out there and you're wanting to be a witness, but people cannot tell us apart, listen to me, not in what we're wearing, but how we're wearing it. Are we doing it to please and entice men? Are we doing it to glorify God? Are we doing it to please and entice women? Or are we doing it to glorify God? Let me tell you something. You want this preacher to get on it? This clothesline works with both sexes. Okay. What's good for the goose? And I'm going to tell you something. When Whatever you put on tomorrow, it may be your uniform. It might be your workout gear. But whatever it is, glorify God in it. Do not draw attention to yourself. Deflect the glory that's His. love me that was two minutes they had modesty they covered their feet feet symbolically would have been dirty because of sandals but it was also obedience God we will not go anywhere until you tell us and where you tell us and then they flew They never stopped flying. They flew. Everywhere. What were they saying? They were saying, we're on the ready. We're right here. God, you made us to fly, so we're going to fly. Okay? And you know what? They flew and they flew and they never got tired. Why? Because God had created them that way. You say, but I'm not a seraphim. I get tired. All right. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I 
will give you rest. And by the way, you don't have to wait to quit flapping your wings to get rested. I don't have to perch somewhere on a, on a twig and get rested. He will rest me as I fly. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and they will not faint. Hey, I'm feeling it right now. Ooh, I feel it right now. I'm telling you. That's worship. Singing the songs of Zion is worship. Preaching is worship. Giving is worship. But let me tell you something. What is better worship? Living. Living is worship. Live as a servant of the Most High. Live for Him. Heavenly Father, help us. Help us, oh God. Give us peace. God, if you, in the way of giving peace, have a different timetable than mine, thank you, Lord. Lord, if you give, thank you. If you take, thank you. Blessed be your name. But Lord, here's what I promise. You told me in Philippians chapter 4 verse 7 that there was an and. That there had to be some things with it. And so Lord, I'll do this. Now, watch me right here. I want them to put on the screen. I want them to put verse 4 on the screen. Because this is the and. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice, verse 4. Let me tell you something. There's a difference between rejoicing and happiness. Okay? Happiness is circumstantial. Okay? It depends on, on what you feel, what makes you feel what you feel. But rejoicing is delight. Rejoicing is a delight in God regardless of how you feel. So rejoice. Now, it says, let your moderation be known to all men. In other words, don't you get too high and don't you get too low. Don't you get too mad. Okay. Don't you get too uh, feisty with your fight. Okay. Let your moderation be known to all men. Let them be able to see that when you wake up in the morning, you really are trying, even though you're not perfect, you really are trying to follow after the will of God and not yours. Why? Because the Lord is at hand. He's coming. Verse 6, go ahead, put it up there. Be careful for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Pray about everything. And thank God for anything okay and then you have the peace of God oh by the way if you need more help verse 8 says whatsoever things are true honest just pure lovely good report virtue if there be any praise think on this these things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do watch this and the God of peace shall be with you. If you're here today and you'd say, Pastor, I'm going to be one of those that's just going to be brutally honest. Peace has been elusive in my mind, in my home, in my body. And I'm asking for prayer. I'm asking God to meet me. I want you to walk up here right now and stand with me. I believe your word. I believe Jesus is coming back, but I have not found rest. I have struggled. I love God. I have faith in Him, but I got a lot more I don't knows than amens. I love you, God. I believe in you, but Lord, there's just a whole lot of question marks in our family, in our life, in my mind, in my body. 
in my future. Watch. Here's what I want you to start. Is I want you to force something. Are you ready? Somebody would say to my dad, well, that wasn't you. He said, sure. Sure wasn't you. Or he said, they said, that was just you. This might start out being just you. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to rejoice. I'm not going to tell you how to do that. That's on you. Okay, I, I, sometimes if we're careful, it's always easy for us to say, raise our hands or do something else. No, I'm going to ask you to rejoice right now. I want you to begin to take delight in God right now. I just want you to take delight in Him. I just want you to let him know that you believe he's God and you're grateful for him and you love him and you're thankful for him and he is your best friend and he's the one that sticks closer than a brother. He's all of that. Just rejoice right now. Just rejoice. Go ahead. Right here in this room. And everybody rejoice with them. Rejoice with them right now. Rejoice with them right now. Hallelujah. Rejoice with them right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Rejoice. 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 And again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Rejoice. Take delight in it. There he goes. There you go. Hey, do you feel it? Do you feel like that the trouble is starting to slip away? That the grip of the trouble in your life is loose and hold? Why? Just rejoice. Just rejoice. Hallelujah. Woo! Come on. Tell your trouble how big your God is right now. Rejoice. Hallelujah. All right. You do that and you trust him. Now, listen. Remember, you can't manufacture it. No more than you can make yourself saved or make yourself healed. You can't make yourself at peace. But God will give you His peace. Mama, little mama, God will give you His peace. You're going to walk back maybe to the same set of circumstance in the moment, but God's going to give you peace and you're going to have victory in knowing that your God is working on your behalf even when you don't see it. Woo! Hey! Feel it right now. Been like pulling teeth, sister. Seemed like it just right out of grasp. But I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit speaks into you and says, just take hold of what I've already promised you. Okay? Don't take hold of circumstance. Take hold of the promise. Okay? Family, know this. God is the healer. There needs to be some healing in home, in folks, in circumstance, and there needs to be a breakthrough. But let me tell you something. God says, I want to break your heart so you can feel me, and then I'll break through your trouble. Oh, I feel his presence in this place. All right, so now what you're going to do, you can't manufacture it. All you're going to do is you're going to receive it. Are you ready? Are you, are you, come on now. I need this group right here. I tell you, uh, do, do you believe it? Do you believe, look, I'm not trying to appeal to your emotions. I'm asking you a question, okay? David said, Lord, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. You, you, need, to, you need to get stri- bow up right here, okay? Bow up right here. I believe God's here. I believe God's going to work on my behalf. He's going to take care of my family and my situations and my trouble. He's going to meet me there. If you believe it now, re- go ahead. Receive it right now. Receive it right now. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Hallelujah. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Woo! Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Receive it, family. Receive it, mama. Receive it, grandmama. Hallelujah. 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 Glory. Receive it. Hallelujah. Thank you, dear Jesus. Hallelujah.